you for coming to the, uh, the AIHI seminar series. My name's Peter Hibbert. I'm your host for this afternoon. Um, I uh, have great pleasure in introdu introducing Professor Stephen Muthing. Stephen's from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, which is one of really the, the world-renowned paediatric hospitals. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to have Stephen here. And Stephen has been one of the architects of Cincinnati being such a successful institution, um, their their journey around improving the hosp hospital, you know, started 15 or 20 years ago, and, and Stephen will will tell you a little bit about that story. So it's fantastic that uh, that we've got Stephen uh, uh, here today. He's a paediatrician and uh, has worked in uh, rural areas as a as a sole practitioner, but also been involved in in hospital networks as well. He's not just um, just hasn't done the, the, the work of improvement at Cincinnati Children's. He's also the architect of a um, paediatric patient safety network across the US and Canada with 100 hospitals. So there's a lot to learn in terms of um, quality improvement and um, spreading good ideas. We've come to know Stephen through our Care Track Kids research project. So we've got uh, a, a lot of the paediatric community involved in that in that project in in three states, and Stephen's an international advisor to to that research. Um, and then with uh, Macquarie and a lot of other partners in in New South Wales, South Australia, and and Queensland, we've managed to, we managed to apply for a Fulbright scholarship and um, and have and got Stephen out on that scholarship so um, so if you do as an idea if you do have people in the US who um, your colleagues with and um, it would you, you feel like a visit would be a really useful thing the Fulbright scholarship is a um, is a is a useful thing to to apply through so Stephen it's great to be here and uh, I uh, just came in on Sunday. I have two weeks in my uh, Fulbright scholarship. I guess it can go up to six months, but I don't think Cincinnati Children's was very keen on letting me stay away for six months. So I have to get back. So uh, what I wanted to do today is we have about an hour, but I really uh, don't want to talk for that whole time. I, I wanted to share something about our journey at Cincinnati Children's and what's been playing out. Because as Peter said, uh, we were, We've actually been around for over a century and, and always were uh, trying to be a great children's hospital, trying to improve, but the, the journey dramatically changed starting about 15 years ago when we started to focus on quality and improvement. And, and in essence, it, we went from an organization that had zero understanding, ability, capability, uh, anything to do with quality improvement. In just 15 years, it's become essentially our core business is about improvement and quality, both focusing at Cincinnati Children's and the care we give, but also the Cincinnati region, the health of the kids in our region. But now it's, it's spread in our effect across the nation and, and really to some degree it's starting to even expand beyond the borders of the United States. So there's so many things I could talk about, but I decided uh, because you're such a, a, a great institute yourself, uh, I didn't want to deal with just some of the fundamentals. It's, it, that's all stuff that you're tremendously aware of. And in fact, I'm learning already while I'm here uh, from you all. So what I wanted to do is spend some time on really focusing on the network. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Cincinnati Children's because I'm taking the assumption most of you know m not much about us. I know Les has been there uh, and visited with us, but I think most of you um, probably not even sure where Cincinnati is. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna give a little bit of background and then dive deep into uh, more about the networks and really then I'm gonna give you three examples uh, of what's going on with these networks. So, and I, and I really wanted to thank Peter and so many other people who uh, over the last, I think it's been about six months since we first uh, Peter contacted me and uh, introduced me to the idea of a, even what a Fulbright specialist was. I honestly didn't know until Peter informed me, but it's, it's been a great, uh, it's been a lot of fun just planning it and, and there's uh, lots to do. I'm, I'm spending a week here in Sydney and then heading over to Adelaide and then over up to Brisbane and uh, spending a lot of time with the uh, pediatric world uh, with, uh, in addition to the time I'm getting to spend here with you all. 
So what I wanted to uh, talk about is, is taking innovation to the bedside to improve outcomes. And, and again, there's much I could talk about because of the work we're focusing on in the care or the health of Cincinnati. But what I wanted to do is, is just give you a sense of what's happened to people at Cincinnati Children's who previously to 15 years ago and, and really over the last five years, we thought our job was if we were just good clinicians and really just did what we were trained to do, that was what our contribution was gonna to be to the care. And now we've come to realize that's just the entrance uh, and the most basic thing we can do. And, and suddenly we've become incredibly excited about the potential we have that goes far beyond what we ever learned about when we were studying to be physicians or nurses or physios or pharmacists. And so I just wanted to thank everybody who, uh, and Peter mentioned, but it's been a tremendous collaboration and partnership to uh, pull this together, and it's an incredible opportunity for me. So I thank everybody on this. So here's what I wanted to talk about. Again, just the background information, um, give you a sense of, of what's driving our work. Uh, and then I want to uh, just take, walk you through these three examples. It's basically something that's just starting something that's been brewing for about two or three years, and then uh, something that's been in place, the safety network over a period of about seven years. So you can see a sense of where things can move from just an early idea to, um, to fruition. So um, Cincinnati Children's, uh, so in case you're not sure where Cincinnati is, we're kind of in the middle of the United States. Uh, if you take a flight and end up somewhere in Chicago, you're not far from where we are. So let me just leave it at that. So. Um, um, it's not a place that people go to uh, vacation and things like that. Uh, and to some degree, Cincinnati Children's should not exist. Uh, we're, we're a city of about uh, one and a half million people, but we're one of the largest children's hospitals in the world. And people come to Cincinnati Children's from all over the world, all over the United States. And, and so at any given time, if you were at Cincinnati Children's and walked around, half of the people there are not from Cincinnati. They're from uh, everywhere else. We, we have, I think, five or six uh, uh, Middle Eastern Arabic interpreters on staff at Cincinnati Children's. Uh, so we're a very unusual place for the middle of the United States. Uh, it's not typical. But I, I give you this background information not to tell you large is good or that makes us better just because we're, we're huge. But just to give you a sense of the complexity of who we are, we, we have over 15,000 employees just in the children's hospital, uh, combining the research and the care and the education and things. We have 673 beds uh, at our facility. It's, it's mostly in one area, but we have two other facilities uh, that encompass all that. We see over, uh, over a million kids per year uh, from both the Cincinnati region and from all over the world. Uh, and we have a very large research facility where um, uh, basically if you think about uh, pediatrics and you know much about the United States, you would say, well, it must be Boston and Philadelphia, and yes, it is, and then it's Cincinnati. So our competitors are essentially our, our good friends at Boston and Philadelphia. So um, we love them. So, um, so what happened to us in around 2000 was this small, sleepy, Children's Hospital in the middle of the United States decided we would change our vision, we would change our mission. And you can see it up there. It says we decided we wanted to be the leader in improving child health. And once you start saying things like that, it starts making you think, well, well, we're not the leader. So if, if we're going to say that, we're going to have to start doing things very differently. It's not going to be okay just to be a really good children's hospital for the kids of the Cincinnati region. We were going to have to start creating audacious goals and even accepting the fact that we don't even know how to do what we need to do to become the leader in improving child health, but this is what we wanted to do. And so in the mission, I just wanted to call out this part, which it, I guess you can't see it very well, can you? Bad coloring, but it's, uh, it's, it's right here. It's, it's to transform the delivery of care through fully integrated, globally recognized research education innovation and, and the word I really wanted to call out was transform. We realized if we kept doing things the way we were going to do, we were going to continue to be a pretty good children's hospital, give pretty good care and that's about as far as we would go and we realized we would have to transform and one of the fundamental things that started at that point was a decision that we were going to start to focus around quality improvement, which would include learning what quality improvement even meant. I don't think we even understood how to spell QI back then. Uh, but 
essentially that kicked off our journey and we've had a number of things that happened to us that just allowed it to accelerate. Um, we were part of some grants that occurred in the United States that essentially were designed around what would happen if we tried to create a Toyota of healthcare. It was a grant called Pursuing Perfection and it allowed us to start working with some of the national and international leaders in improvement, which eventually led to the the center that I help lead, which is called the Anderson Center, and it's named after Jim Anderson. Uh, Les knows him. Uh, Jim Anderson was our CEO when we started this journey, and when he retired about seven or eight years ago, we named the center after him because of everything he had done to uh, get this journey going. But if the vision of Cincinnati Children's to be the leader in improving child health, the vision of the Anderson Center is to be the catalyst for improving child health. So in essence, the Anderson Center doesn't do anything. The Anderson Center doesn't improve anything. Everybody else does all the work. Our job is to help them accomplish the goals that they set out. So whether it's improving outcomes, it's improving experience, improving safety, and improving uh, affordability of care, the Anderson Center's job is to help that happen. And within our mission, we have multiple things we try to accomplish. These are all the things I could talk about. I'd be excited to talk about all of these. So the, essentially, the first one is trying to improve the health care system. So it's basically trying to use Cincinnati Children's as a lab to uh, and show that this is what it might look like, that transforming health care within Cincinnati Children's to achieve unprecedented outcomes, experience, and affordability of care and safety. It's helping Cincinnati kids to be the healthiest in the nation, and we are far from it. Cincinnati has a terrible history of uh, significant poverty amongst kids, which leads to all kinds of other problems with their health. Uh, we've had a tremendous problem with infant mortality. The United States is not great at that in the first place, and Cincinnati is even worse than the United States. And so it was clear to us we're never going to be a good children's hospital, much less a great children's hospital, unless the kids of Cincinnati start to be one of the healthiest populations in the United States. So we had to take that on too. Creating new knowledge and accelerating its application, which relates to what I'm gonna talk about, but it's essentially our research arm of the Anderson Center. The one I'm gonna focus on is cultivating learning health systems. And then finally, developing leaders for health system transformation. That includes both within Cincinnati, but really it's moved to building leaders for all over the United States, particularly in pediatrics, We've tried to stay out of the adult healthcare business. Uh, we were leaving that to others. So uh, we uh, have come to realize that we're never going to get there unless truly clinicians and other leaders of the healthcare system learn improvement and, and learn how to transform systems. And so we've taken that on in a big way. But I'm going to focus on this cultivating learning health systems. And I think some of you are aware of what that means, but let me just explain what I think it means. It's a piece of what we're doing at, at the Anderson Center. So just to talk you through again, this is what we do, but then I'm gonna focus on the learning networks or learning health systems. We do health services research. We do all the help with all the improvement and anywhere from just basic improvement skills to lean to human-centered design to human factors engineering, all of which has been developed over the last 15 years. Improvement science education and coaching, which is all this building capability. Uh, we focused on decision making. Initially, we were focused on evidence based decision making. Now it's much, much more around shared decision making, really understanding how to partner effectively with patients, and in our case, more of the families. Uh, we've really come a long way on safety and regulatory, and I'm, I was so torn because this is my passion. I wanted to talk about this, but I thought this might be more interesting for you. And then a lot around learning how to use data effectively, both in terms of analytics. Uh, helping people understand their performance measurement, how to use data effectively at the front line. And then finally, uh, the whole idea of how do we uh, tra be transparent about our effectiveness, our, our outcomes, and, and work with families so that they can make decisions about whether they should even come to Cincinnati Children's. And uh, obviously many in, uh, families and more and more uh, as we go along want to know uh, the performance data of a system before they choose to uh, get on an airplane or make a long drive. But what I really want to focus on is the learning networks. And if you think about a learning health system, uh, the Institute of Medicine uh, put out a, uh, a concept paper about this, uh, which really talks about uh, patients and providers uh, partnering. What we really think of in terms of uh, a learning network and what we've gone at in terms of um, creating these learning health systems that 
go well beyond Cincinnati is that we form a learning network when there's a group of people that want to come together and take on a shared audacious goal that is bigger than anyone could ever do by themselves. And so whether that might be in the case of the network that I helped lead is our goal that we took on was eliminate serious harm at every children's hospital in North America. Now clearly nobody can do that by ourselves. That's such an audacious goal. We don't even know if we can accomplish it, but it's clearly nobody can do that by themselves. Or another network was, it took on the audacious goal of every child with and young adult with inflammatory bowel disease should be in remission at all times. Another one took on the goal of eliminating emissions for asthma across the entire region of, uh, of Cincinnati. So eliminate the need for any child with asthma ever to be in the hospital. So one of the fundamentals of creating a learning health system that, that we're driving at is taking on together a shared audacious goal. A learning health system, a learning network has to agree to be data driven. And so a network, one of the fundamental things they put in place at the very beginning is we will agree to share all of our data. And then taking on a concept of it's all teach, all learn. That once you join a network, you're always better than somebody. So we expect you to share and teach, but somebody's always better than you. So humbly ask them why they're better than you and can you please learn from them. So it's all teach, all learn. And then finally, building a deep partnership with the patients and families who are really the end users of the learning network and learning how to partner. And then over time, partnering also with researchers, innovators to constantly move toward that audacious goal. So more to come on learning networks, you'll see as I uh, spell that out. But that's why I wanted to talk about this particular track because Seven years ago, we didn't know how to even organize a learning network, and now we can't stop creating learning networks. And so what's happened in just these seven years, we initially, this is back in 08 or so, we had eight teams, eight single digits, eight teams within networks. And now, uh, as of last fall, or our fall, sorry, October of 2016, uh, we were up over 400 teams, and I think uh, that's old now. I think we're pushing up toward 500 teams in networks. And uh, right now we have uh, about 10 to 12 networks that are uh, becoming fully mature, and we have four more that are, are trying to start, and that's what that orange line is up there. Uh, if, if those uh, additional networks uh, go on to really become a learning network, we'll be pushing up and are pushing up towards 500 teams. So these are... These teams, what do they look like? They might be a clinic at a hospital. It might be an entire hospital, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these are teams of, uh, from different children's hospitals, different clinics that have combined to uh, pursue that shared audacious goal, shared data, all teach, all learn, and partner with families to accomplish that goal. And so this is what's happened in just seven or eight years. None of this matters. This would just be an interest or semi-interesting talk if this didn't result in improvement. And this is, so I'm just giving you a little bit of a sense of what's happening in terms of improvement toward these audacious goals so that it might intrigue you a little bit throughout the rest of the discussion. So this is the, uh, called Improved Care Now. This is the um, network that's trying to get every kid with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, into remission. When they started about seven or eight years ago, they were at 57% of the kids in the United States were in remission. So this is now they're up to about 30,000 kids that are being cared for throughout this network. In just about seven or eight years, they are now at 82% of the kids in the United States are now in remission. So they went from 57% to 82% are in remission. And that's with no new drugs, no new improvement. That's just creating a network that is all teach, all learn, and sharing data to improve care. This one is for a uh, condition that uh, babies are born with called hypoplastic left. It's basically where they have half a heart. And uh, it has a relatively high mortality rate. 11% uh, of the kids would die before, between the time they were born before they could get to their second surgery. In just over about three or four years, they've now cut that almost in half so that they're down to almost 5% uh, mortality rate. 
Uh, and on one hand, they get very excited, but this network is heavily driven by parents. And a mother stood up at one of their network meetings and said, this is incredibly exciting, but every one of those points is a friend. And we're not done until that is zero. That's the, part, the power of partnering with families. This is the network I'm going to talk about as solutions for patient safety. This is just one chart from that one that describes the serious safety event rate uh, has dropped by over 40%. Serious safety events are the worst of the worst events. They're, I forget what you call them here, serious uh, sentinel. sentinel events. Um, but across the network, we've reduced that. I'll show you some more data. And this is one that's focused on uh, uh, early elective deliveries across the entire state of Ohio, which is our state. They've reduced the uh, percentage of, uh, or the rate of early elective inductions that can result in severe prematurity or even death. Uh, and they've reduced that by over 75% across the entire state of Ohio. So this is tens of thousands of deliveries. And there's some additional data with that, which that one I'm so excited about. They've actually reduced this um, uh, and, um, across all segments of the population and actually reduced the disparity that had existed because that was heavier for uh, people uh, with lower socioeconomic uh, class. And they've actually reduced that even more for those kids. So it's a very exciting time. So I just share all that. I could share more, but I, I just throw that up to say, OK, maybe there is something here instead of just some guy from Cincinnati who's telling some stories here. So here's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to walk it through three examples. Again, an early one that's just still in concept, in concept. It's just getting started. We have about 20 of these going on at any given time right now. And then the second one is one that actually started as a concept about four years ago, three years ago, and is now in the almost getting ready to be a true network phase. And then finally, I want to focus in on that, the network that I've been helping lead is so you can see what a mature network might look like. So this first one is uh, uh, being driven by a plastic surgeon, a pediatric plastic surgeon by the, surgeon by the name of Tom Sitzman. And uh, his particular focus for plastic surgery is helping kids who are born with cleft palates or cleft lips. So what he decided is, I think we should start to reduce the rate of complications from cleft lip and cleft palate repair. And so basically he said the aim that he wanted to take on was decreasing the complication rates after cleft palate repair through a surgeon-directed audit and feedback intervention. And he took this on not because it was a new idea, but because he had seen it in other areas, in cardiothoracic surgery and other areas, particularly in adult care. People had done some incredible things, but nobody had ever looked at this and certainly hadn't tried to bring plastic, pediatric plastic surgeons together to say, could we actually help each other here? Because historically, for decades, they've all worked very independently. So what Tom did is he looked at this and at uh, cleft lip and cleft palate, the second most uh, frequent congenital anomaly. There's about 4,500 kids each year that are born with cleft cleft lips in the United States, and about 7,000 kids that are born with cleft palates in the United States. So at any one hospital, it's not very common. But when you look at how many kids have this across the United States, there's a lot of kids being affected by this. And so when you start thinking about, well, if there is a complication rate, and you've got 7,000 of these, even a complication rate of 1% means you've got 70 kids each year that are having a complication from their attempted repair. And what does the complication look like? Just so you know, this isn't something minor. Ideally, you close, you, I know you can't see this very well, but you close the palate so it looks like a normal palate, and hopefully the child can eat and eventually speak normally. But what can happen is it can leave a fistula. In other words, you try to close it, you try to repair it, and it breaks through. And, and essentially, the kid ends up uh, really struggling with both eating and drinking and, and eventually speech and, and uh, trying to be a healthy kid. So what Tom did, uh, designed some work where uh, he got, I think it's seven surgeons from around the United States, basically friends, uh, to agree that they would review 30 cases if they had 30 cases or as many cases as they, they had and essentially self-report their complication rate and, and there was a fair amount of work they had to do but they basically had to agree to review their own cases and submit these and then he designed a feedback stage and then eventually they would do intervention based on what did we find in the uh, feedback sta uh, stage. And then his study would end.
but now Tom can't stop himself from thinking what's the potential. And what he, uh, he did not want me to share the actual names of the physicians, uh, although when they shared the data together, they did share it by name. So Tom cleverly decided to name after the apostles. Um, so, um, and this is, so this is actual data, but just we removed the names. And so this is uh, the complication rates that these surgeons reported. So you can easily see, oh, and, and I'm sorry, here's the number of surgeries that they had reviewed. And so you can see uh, there's multiple physicians with a median level of zero, but then there's, here's a physician, a surgeon who's got a 10% complication rate. Here's one with 3.2% and here's one with 0.4. And when they showed this data, I think you can guess what they all said is, Either you said, oh, aren't I a great surgeon, or oh my god, I'm, I'm the 10% or I'm the 3.2%. And so what they agreed to do is look at this data together. They actually came together in a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss this. They all agreed ahead of time. And they discussed what they saw in potential causes. And then the three surgeons with the highest fistula rates decided and agreed that they would visit uh, one or two surgeons with a low rate. They would literally get on a plane and go see them. They would observe them in the OR and they would get feedback on their operative skills, which is an incredible thing to get some surgeons to agree to. <laughs> and then they agreed, those three physicians, surgeons agreed they would make a personalized action plan for what they were gonna do. So uh, in a qualitative study, Tom uh, did some interviews of these people and uh, these are just some of the quotes he got is, I'm extremely isolated and I don't know what others do and I don't know where better techniques could possibly be employed. So in other words, the, one of the surgeons who was going to do this had always been kind of wondering for years, I wonder if I'm good, I wonder if I'm bad and I have no idea. Afterwards, he got incredible feedback from these surgeons about how valuable this was. Here's one quote, is the absolute best thing I gained was his dissection of the nasal mucosa, basically his surgical technique. That was an aha moment. The entire trip was worth that particular moment. And so each of these three folks have uh, put in uh, a personalized action plan. And Tom, it, it's not, he's not done with the study at this point, but he's already getting uh, verbal reports from these surgeons as they've had no complications since that time. So we'll see how it all plays out. But Tom thinks he's on to something. And so he's got to finish his study. He's, he's thinking about applying for a grant to test really a, the effectiveness at a larger scale of this intervention. But what he really wants to do is start a network so he can do something about the 7,000 kids each year that are born with cleft palate. So this is how these things get started, and Tom is surrounded by people who are doing this, and Tom can think about, it's not, I don't want to just be a great surgeon myself, I want to start to have an impact on, on 7,000 kids, and I can never do enough surgery to affect those 7,000 kids, so the only way I'm going to be able to help them is to create a network where we can all learn together. So this is a, the uh, middle stage one. This is being led by a nephrologist, a pediatric nephrologist named Stu Goldstein who actually came to Cincinnati Children's because he knew this stuff was starting. He came from Texas. And what he had a vision of is that as a nephrologist, he knew kids that are being cared for in a pediatric hospital get all kinds of tough medications for their chemotherapy, for their uh, intensive antibiotics, uh, and things like that. And sometimes the combination of those medications, all well intended, cause acute kidney injury. So Stu had the idea, I wonder if we could do better. And so his, uh, Stu's a very clever guy, so he knew uh, marketing's important. So he came up with a clever name for his work, called it Ninja, and it's got some, it means something. It's something about nephrotoxic injury, something or other. But he knew people would be more excited about his network if he called it something clever like Ninja. And their vision is children should only get the nephrotoxic or, or kidney damaging medications they need and only for the duration they need them. And his theory was, if we can figure out which kids are on these scary medication combinations and really give some information in real time to the people that are caring for them and make sure that they're aware of what's going on, 
and detect early on that these children's kidneys are starting to be damaged, they'd be able to decrease the percentage of kids that get kidney damage and the intensity of that kidney damage. So what he did is similar to Tom, but he did his early work just at Cincinnati Children's because we had enough kids at Cincinnati Children's to focus on this. And he developed improvements that focused on that patient population at Cincinnati Children's. This work is actually published in PEDS. Uh, I think it's from about three or four years ago now. And, uh, and the early work describes how we created a, uh, uh, we used our electronic health record to create a uh, uh, real-time detection system that fed information straight to the pharmacist and the clinicians so that they would know every day which child was at risk and which child was starting to show early signs of potential acute kidney injury. And the team could make adjustments in the medication in real time. And what uh, he initially showed was that the rate of exposure to these medications and early signs of acute kidney injury was much higher than we ever thought. And it's actually at a scary rate. And what he showed was it actually the rate of acute kidney injury at our hospital at least, and we may be the worst hospital in, in America or maybe we're just a typical hospital, but the rate of acute kidney injury at Cincinnati Children's was higher than the rate of CLAPSI uh, central line infections, higher than the rate of catheter-associated urinary tract infections, and everybody has been ignoring it for decades. And so what they found is once you put in this system, we find a rate of around 11 per 1,000 uh, patient days, non-ICU patient days. And these are some of the sickest of the sick kids. These are often kids who are getting bone marrow transplants or cystic fibrosis kids are getting tough combinations of antibiotics and things. So these are not healthy kids. And what Stu also showed in some other work that's been published is if you get acute kidney injury when you're in the hospital for something else, you have evidence of chronic kidney injury years later. And so we think this isn't one of those events that's just bad today. This could damage your kidneys for the rest of your life, which is the last thing these kids need because they're already dealing with some other condition. And so what they found over time is they were able to reduce the rate by over 40 or 27% uh, at Cincinnati Children's. And so just in our population, just in Cincinnati Children's, we avoided just in the first year 908 days of acute kidney injury. So that's, uh, you know, it's the combination of how many kids and times the number of days they would have had acute kidney injury if we hadn't reduced the rate. And then uh, we went on to show, and this has been published now, is that we were able to sustain this over time. And actually, more recently, it's actually been decreasing even more. Uh, so now we're over 40%. So, Stu was at the same place Tom was and said, I want to start spreading this across the nation. And so Stu got a grant from uh, a couple people in the United States, AHRQ, which is one of our uh, research funding uh, federal sources, and then a private foundation, the Casey Lee Ball Foundation, that uh, has a focus on kidney problems. And he essentially said, I want to start building a network. And so he approached nine of his friends uh, and it's, it's the usual suspects, including Seattle and Boston and, and Philadelphia and things, and said, would you be willing to join a network and we would all go after eliminating acute kidney injury together? And so they, they had to figure out what, how they were going to do this. They uh, adopted that audacious goal. They had to learn how to, what data are we going to collect, what kind of detection system. They had to gr agree on definitions. And they've been working this out over a period of two years. And they... Uh, I, they have some early data, but basically what they found once they put the detection system in, essentially the, the rates across the nation were pretty similar to the way Cincinnati Children's started. So thankfully we found we weren't as bad as uh, we were fearful. Uh, we actually were normal, uh, but it, it makes you uh, pause and think of, oh my gosh, that means there are just thousands and thousands of kids that are getting acute kidney injury every year across the United States. And it really makes you want to get going fast. So they've been collecting data. Essentially what happened to them was what happened at Cincinnati Children's is initially the rate went up because we learned how to detect these kids. We learned how to find them. We put in a system in place. And now they're just beginning. And this is uh, from last uh, September. And it's actually starting to creep down now so that they think they're on the track to uh, show the same kind of reduction that we did at Cincinnati. And actually three additional hospitals have agreed to join the network even without the funding from the, uh, because, uh, without the funding from the research grants because they just couldn't, they heard about it and they couldn't stop themselves. They wanted to join. And so where this network is going is they, they've agreed that these are the, 
the essentials of having an acute kidney injury program at a children's hospital. And what they're studying is actually something fascinating is they're studying the con contextual measures in essentially trying to figure out what is it about some of the hospitals that will make them improve faster than other hospitals? Is it things about leadership? Is it things about safety culture? Is it about their uh, involvement of their pharmacists? Is it involvement of their families and things like that? Because what they're trying to do is prepare themselves for going national. And so that they think the better they have all this worked out ahead of time, the more they'll be able to help um, uh, hospitals as they go national. The other thing that this network's doing in classic improvement way is thinking about what can we do to make the right thing the easy thing? And so that they've essentially been developing the software design for an electronic tool that they can then give away to these hospitals that would be able to, uh, these hospitals that would join the network eventually would be able to just adopt this electronic tool rather than having to create it like these early hospitals have done. So it's the all teach, all learn starting even before they've gone national. And What's happening uh, because of that work is the acute kidney injury team has approached, or the Ninja network, has approached the National Safety Network and said, um, we could do this two ways. One is we could create our own national network, or maybe could we partner together since you've already got 130 children's hospitals, and maybe we could do that. So I'm telling you that because I'm going to show you the way the National Safety Network is has designed itself to be ready for things like acute kidney injury networks coming even before they knew the acute kidney injury network was even going to exist. So the third example and the last example, and then we're going to open it up for discussion I'm going to give you, is a relatively mature network that still is growing, is still learning how to do this, but this is a network that's been uh, in place for about seven years. So it's called SPS, which is Solutions for Patient Safety, and this started in the state of Ohio where Cincinnati Children's and the seven other children's hospitals in our state started to learn how to work together, not that differently than the acute kidney injury or ninja group started learning how to work together. What could be the audacious goal that we would take on? How would we start to share safety data with each other, harm data with each other? What does all teach, all learn mean when you start doing safety? And then about uh, five or six years ago, uh, uh, SPS got some federal funding to start going national and went from eight to 33 to 75 and now it just keeps growing and now as of uh, a couple months ago it's up to 132 children's hospitals with about 125 of those being in the United States and the others being in Canada. And the big audacious goal, and I mentioned it earlier, that SPS took on was working together to eliminate serious harm across all children's hospitals. So it's eliminate in all children's hospitals. So have we eliminated serious harm? No. And have we hit all children's hospitals? No. But that's the audacious goal we've agreed to. And the other thing I just want to point out, uh, I'm not going to get into this today, but uh, we don't say patient serious harm because SPS has taken on staff safety as well as patient safety. So it's whoever gets harmed in a children's hospital. It doesn't restricting itself to just whether you happen to be a patient in a children's hospital. So the part of SPS I wanted to talk to you about, I could talk to you about so much of what it's done. It actually has 25 work groups focused on different things. What I want to show you is what's happened in the thinking about creation of standardization across the nation and creation of evidence. Because it's changed the way we're thinking about the development of evidence across the nation and not relying, as we have historically, on just published literature and peer-reviewed uh, uh, randomized controlled trials. So one of the theories of safety is if you know what's the right thing to do to prevent harm, so in other words, the process, if you get that to be reliable, that you'll lower the rates of harm. And this has been shown in literature in, in many, many hospitals, just thousands of hospitals around the world for things like CLABSI or, or central line infections, for, central, or, uh, for catheter urinary tract infections, for surgical site infections, pressure ulcers or pressure injuries, falls, and about a dozen more things. But everybody knew this. Everybody knows that, well, there are things we think, and people call them bundles or people call them other things, but basically there's this theory out there that if we do the right thing and we do it reliably, the harm rate will go down. And, and there's lots of literature to show that. And we've got our own results now. So this is the rate of catheter-associated urinary tract infections for the entire nation. 
and you can see it's gone down just over the last several years from a rate that was a little above two and a half to uh, about 1.9, and now it's, it's actually creeping down to about one. And so that's just one example of what SPS has been doing over the last few years. And so this, so we're actually focusing on many hospital acquired conditions all at the same time. And so this is the rate, this is the amount of reduction in each of those hospital acquired conditions over the last about four to five years for the entire nation. Uh, so this is across all the children's hospitals. This isn't one children's hospital or the best children's hospital. This is the entire nation. And so I put this up here, but it's actually on the website. We, we put all this out on the public website so you can actually go and look at the run charts yourselves and, uh, and see what this looks like for all these conditions. But what really this has led us to is we realize now we don't have to rely on somebody else to create the evidence because we now have the largest data set there's ever been for pediatric safety and every month it gets bigger. So every month hospitals submit their performance, their reliability of doing the prevention standard or the prevention bundle and they submit their harm data and pu pooling it is now the largest pediatric data set that links process reliability to harm rates that there's ever been. And again, it just keeps getting bigger every month. And so that data set can now describe what works and what doesn't work. And so now SPS is starting to realize it's nothing but a giant standardization machine. So this is the design is new ideas start wherever they start outside the network. Then we start figuring out what should the standard be using the data. And then we all just do it. And then once we've reached our goals, then we got to start cycling up and taking new harms. So we have to sustain things without having all the rigor and all the intensity. And eventually we got to figure out how to help everybody else, that, even those that aren't in the network. So the details of this are that discovery comes from where it comes from, whether it's the Toms or the Stews with their acute kidney injury. But there's people out there who are coming up with incredibly good ideas. But in, in, in some of them are having success and showing early signs of work, but they just don't have a way to get this to spread. So SPS does not need to worry about coming up with the new ideas. They're happening. We need to be able to be receptive to these new ideas like acute kidney injury. And then in the pioneer phase, we essentially ask which hospitals want to work intensively together, submit incredible amounts of data, and basically work out the details of what should the definition be, what should the detection system be, and then study what factors work and what factors don't work, and then show that when we do these factors reliably, we get this percentage of harm reduction across our volunteer hospitals. Initially, this was taking us about two years. The last one that, that has been able to move through this, and it looks like they're already moving through in about 18 months. So we, we don't know how fast we can get this, but so far, it looks like it's taken us about 18 months to two years. The aviator phase is essentially the pioneers have shown us the way. Now, if you want to be part of SPS, when things come down to aviator, that means you've agreed you're going to adopt those. And so what this essentially starts to look like is families can start to believe that wherever they go in the United States, they will get the exact same standard, whether they walk into Cincinnati or Philadelphia or Boston or Omaha, Nebraska, or wherever it might be, or even up to Alberta, Canada. And then finally, things can move over into orbiting where we sustain, we get less intensive about the data collection. But once SPS takes on something, we're going to track how the performance and that outcome rate for the rest forever. And then finally, we're trying to figure out how to spread things. And so on the website, we now share all of our definitions, all of our best practices, all of our standards. So that's available now to every, literally every human in the world right now. Whatever we learn is now on the public website. So we're not keeping anything secret. And so finally, this is where things are. Uh, so, um, and things keep moving down this way. So just recently, just last week at a national learning session for SPS, uh, Catheter-associated urinary tract infections and surgical site infections move down to orbiting and different things are moving in. And soon in January, acute kidney injury, the agreement's been made is that the Ninja network or acute kidney injury is gonna become pioneer in uh, January. So, uh, so that this design of can we receive new ideas from outside SPS and, and help essentially be the standardization machine for the nation is starting to happen.
Or? I would say, I mean, just thinking, now I'm down to thinking how long did it take surgical site infection and adverse drug events. Um, uh, I'd say we're closer to two to three years on those. Um, I'm a little, it's hard to answer because we've been growing so fast. Some of these hospitals who join go, pioneer what? Aviator what? Standard practices what? Oh my gosh, I didn't think I was signing up for all this. So um, I, what we have is some interesting data is that the hospitals that first joined four or five years ago are moving faster than the hospitals that are coming in later. But, but we're looking at the entire group as a group and, and not getting into, well, this group's better than you and things like that. So I think that that aviator status, you would think it would go faster because, oh, the answer has been made by your peer hospitals. But I think there's still this, um, still the traditional sense of, I'm not sure I believe it because I wasn't a member of the pioneer group. And, and so I think this whole idea of this culture of accepting the fact that you can be in the pioneer group if you want to be, but if you're not in it, it's still going to happen and they're still going to create a standard and it's your choice. You can either help to make the standard or you can just wait and receive the standard. But more and more, um, you can feel the pressure of uh, what used to be, well, I, I, I guess I'll accept the standard. That's really starting to get suppressed. So I think my answer to you is two years, three years, whatever it takes, should improve over time. But that's a pretty significant culture change uh, because for decades, we all just assumed we have to figure it out on our own. And, and um, the idea that we're all in this together is still, it's only been five years. It's, I think it's gonna take another 10 or 15 years before it's just, that's the way it is. It's not working. Because uh, we actually, I, I'm saying that with confidence because we actually track how many people hit our website and it's just, it's low and it's flat. So we believe there's something that we're not doing right yet. Simply making a website and putting it out there, even with beautiful picture of children and, and stories that go with it and some videos. Like here's, for example, the teams for, um, that are in the aviator status have created videos of literally uh, people can just download and this is how to do the standard created by teams of actual nurses who actually do this care and they're all out there for free and nobody's hitting them. Let me tell you, here's something I'm thinking and I would be interested in your impression of this is I think one of the potential ways around that because I, I just don't know how we can get everybody to be an active participant, uh, but maybe we can. But I'm intrigued on the idea of, I wonder what would happen if the parents around the world found out about this and knew that on that website was the right answer and could they push this toward hospitals or toward providers in a way that uh, comes at, make it kind of a movement. I uh, totally agree with you, and I certainly never learned any of this until the last 10 years. Um, uh, I, I'm optimistic because I see these young nursing students and physician students, um, they're not waiting to be taught, they're out learning it on their own, and in fact, we have uh, young med students and residents coming to our network learning sessions. No, I don't even know if they're invited, but they're just starting to show up and things like that. Uh, and they are starting to talk in ways, so I don't think they're gonna be tolerant of, of not being taught it. I think they're going to, they can see this, and I think they just, they, I don't know what about them, but they can see systems clearer than I ever saw them. So that's part of the agreement when you, to join SPS, your chief executive has to sign a commitment, the top of it says, I agree I will not compete on safety. And it says, which means I will never use the data for competitive advantage. And then down about number four it says, 
when things reach the aviator stage, which I don't even think they understand that when they sign it, but is we agree we will adopt the standards that are developed by SPS. Now, that's one thing for the chief executive to sign it, but again, as I was describing, this is, this is overwhelming for hospitals as they join, and, and because you know, even if they have 10 people that really believe, they have to go home and explain to their pediatric surgeons that there's this, there's this thing called SPS, and they've created a standard, and they go, what are you talking about? And, you know, who says I have to do what SPS says? So that's the culture movement that, you know, and I think it relates to why is it taking so long? so we haven't figured it out yet we have some pretty small hospitals that are winging it uh, so essentially they're part of a larger system a, a university health system and they've got like two wards or something like that and they struggle and they talk about how they don't get the resources they need and things like that but um, we haven't yet figured out uh, that if you're this size don't don't get involved you're just you're just going to regret it or you'll you'll just be frustrated. Um, I think that's some of that, like that contextual stuff that uh, the acute kidney injury is figuring out. We're very interested to figure out if they start to figure out some of these answers. There's a lot of variation in your, Absolutely. your hospital rates. Right? Yeah, and how many resources you put in there, how well do people actually understand QI, what, you know, what's your size, you know, what's your complexity, all those kind of things, which no, I, I'd say our understanding of those kind of answers is still very rudimentary at this point. It's self-sustaining, but that's what I lose sleep over. Is uh, you know, so we have. Uh, I didn't talk about this much, but we have a whole arm of the work that's focused on the role of the chief executive and the board of trustees that runs the hospital. So we have uh, groups that get together that is just private for the chief executives and the board because our belief is, if we keep them focused on this, they'll figure out a way to keep everybody else on board. So six or seven years into it, there's been three hospitals that dropped out. Two of them came back. So, so far, just the movement itself is uh, keeping, keeping it going. But we have a board of, of our chief executive, nine chief executives who are overseeing this that we report to. That's their number one push to us is do not stop getting results because as soon as you do people will start finding other ways to spend their time and energy so i think so far we're building it on continuous forward movement but i worry about that okay thank you everybody thank you. Thank you.